What does it mean to be represented in Congress? Have you met your congressional representative? What issues concern you most? War, education, environment, women's rights, gay rights, health care, immigration, budget and debt crisis, tax reform. Lloyd Doggett has represented Texas in Congress since 1995, first serving in the 10th District and now a representative for the 25th District that covers part of Austin. We are pleased that our conversation today on Access News is with Representative Doggett. You're watching Access News, hands on news. Thank you, Representative, for being with us here on Access News today. We appreciate that you're here with us. It's a pleasure to join you. Your program is providing a valuable service. That's nice to know. Thank you. I'd like to talk um, first about Thomas Jefferson. Throughout his lifetime, he was a huge supporter of having an informed citizenry through education. He was a champion in education. One of his famous quotes was if a nation expects to be ignorant and free in a state of civilization it expects what never was and never will be how do you relate to that quote well i'm very troubled that in texas we're not investing enough in education i believe we should be doing more from pre-k to post-grad this is not only about assuring each individual an opportunity to achieve their full God-given potential. It is about having a workforce that is competitive as we compete e economically with the rest of the world. And it, it, and it is also, as Jefferson said, essential to assure that our democracy functions. Obviously, education is a big issue in Texas as, as well as all over the nation. What challenges do we face today related to education and, and what, have we be doing, what have we been doing to address those challenges? Well, I think in Texas the biggest challenge we face is Rick Perry. I believe that the decision to not fund the foundation school program for the first time since almost World War II uh, was a fundamental error. Uh, we have to make decisions in priorities in our state budget. And there was a dramatic underfunding by billions of dollars of our public education system last year. Uh, secondly, uh, I think it's a mistake to take money from the public schools, particularly when they're underfunded, to divert that money outside of the public school system. And I think it was a mistake in the last session of the Texas legislature to cut the amount of money available for students to access higher education. Uh, I believe uh, at the federal government level that the measures that uh, I've supported to increase Pell Grants, uh, and I was the author of a provision that permits each student that who would have expenses for education beyond high school, wherever that might be, uh, to get $2,500 directly off their federal taxes. That uh, goes a long way to cover tuition and books here at Austin Community College, uh, Texas State, UT, wherever a student might go uh, for advanced uh, educational opportunities. Why do you think that everyone in Congress um, couldn't agree on that educational issue? Why would someone um, like Rick Perry want to um, decrease funding for education. It just it seems so important. Why can't we all agree on the topic? Well, it is really important. And I guess there are trade-offs. You can't get uh, more education investment for free. Uh, and you have to be willing to support the revenue measures to finance education. In Governor Perry's case, he wanted to run as a governor who had cut spending and never raised taxes. Uh, we can't get uh, quality education for free. Money is not the only answer, but without the financial resources, 
uh, to pay our teachers, uh, to broaden educational opportunity for more students, uh, we really have a gap. You know, we hear so much about, and I'm sure we'll be talking about it today, about the federal debt and the federal deficit, but I think we get an opportunity deficit when we don't uh, provide the resources to allow each child, each young person, to get all the education for which they're willing to work. I would like to talk about the na national debt, but before we get there, um, do you want to say anything about your involvement with the Texas Association for the Deaf? Oh, yes. Uh, I uh, had the good fortune, first of all, to grow up here in Austin. And at the uh, young age of 26, which you can tell was a couple years ago for me, uh, I was elected uh, as what they call the baby senator to serve in the state senate here in Austin and in four surrounding counties. I had the job that Sen Senator Kirk Watson has today. At that time, I was good friends with the late Texana Khan and with Jerry Hassel, uh, a legendary figure in the deaf community here in Austin. And I worked with them on uh, some of the first legislation for deaf interpreters in our court system, in our administrative hearings, and also to support the Texas Association for the Deaf. And I'm proud that I still have from my days as a state senator an award from the Texas Association for the Deaf. In Congress, my contact has been more indirect. Uh, the national government moves slowly and deals with a wide range of issues. But I know uh, that these issues remain very important when I hear about uh, the incident with Esther Valdez, where local law enforcement uh, failed to recognize what signing is about, <laughs> and that you can have a vigorous argument in signing uh, just uh, as anyone else might have. And I think it is good that out of that unfortunate incident, there is greater awareness from our law enforcement officers and others of the deaf community. Uh, on a more positive uh, basis, I uh, was pleased the other afternoon to turn on signing time on PBS and see that uh, our young uh, Texans are learning about the um, diversity within our society and the diverse ways of communicating, including signing. I want to say thank you on behalf of the deaf community for your support throughout the year. So we hope to see that continued support. Absolutely. Now related um, back to the national debt crisis, um, we are facing a huge crisis in America. Is it okay to blame the president or Congress or both? I mean, maybe blame isn't the right word for the situation because really our debt seems it's inevitable at this point. It seems impossible to kind of get ahead. Is it too late? Well, it's not too late, but we do need to move forward in a bipartisan way to try to come together to address some of the big problems that our country faces. In this election year, we've been unable to do that. I believe the President and the members of Congress all have to accept responsibility uh, for the situation we're in. It is important to reflect on the history of how we got where we are. Uh, I serve on the House Budget Committee and the House Ways and Means Committee, which is responsible for taxes, Medicare, and Social Security. I remember when Alan Greenspan came to speak uh, to us at the committee and responded to my questions that uh, we could, we needed the Bush tax cuts because we were reducing the debt too quickly and it would be, it would create an unstable bond market. Now we're at the opposite end of that. I think the unpaid for uh, Bush tax cuts, which were not successful in stimulating the economy, two wars that were not paid for, and then an economic downturn from ineffective regulation of the financial markets, all played a major role in producing the debt that we have today. Uh, and as we look at how to address the debt, we ought not, for example, uh, to shift too much burden onto our seniors 
uh, too much denial of opportunity on our youth. We need a balanced approach. That balanced approach has to involve revenue as well as the control of spending. I think you get an indication of the problems we face from one of the early Republican presidential primary debates when the Republican candidates were offered the alternative of $10 of spending cuts for $1 of new tax revenues, they rejected that alternative. We cannot get the debt problem solved without shared sacrifice. That's why I oppose continuing tax breaks for billionaires, for those at the very top of the economic ladder. I believe they can remain successful I'm not attacking them. I just believe that they can be successful in America at the tax rates that applied in the Clinton era and that they have a responsibility to support the success that is the greatest democracy in the world, to pay for our national security and for our other vital services. Does that relate to the recent Wall Street protests? where people are talking about the 1%, would you say that that relates? It does, and while I don't agree with all the tactics that were used with those groups, I certainly share their concern that Wall Street is a power unto itself. Uh, I voted against the bank bailout, not because I thought inaction was the best approach, but because there were not appropriate conditions on bankers' salaries on paying off foreign investors and the like, and many other aspects of the bank bailouts. And I think Wall Street still has too much power over Congress and over our administrative uh, institutions. I'm a strong supporter of the regulations that Congress approved, the new law that has led to some regulations that is designed to uh, provide protection on things like reverse mortgages, payday lenders, uh, some of the mortgage abuses that have occurred. Uh, we need, uh, I, I would say, you know, I, I agree with the Tea Party about some of the dangers of big government, but where I really disagree with them on is the failure to recognize the dangers from some of the other giant interests uh, in our society, and one of those is Wall Street. And you have to have strong, effective law enforcement from government to stand up to Wall Street or a giant insurance company, or a pharmaceutical company that takes advantages, advantage of our seniors. And while we're on the, the topic of, of budget, um, in the past we talked about that Congress should live by the same rules as the rest of us, and I agree with you. Um, it seems that that doesn't often happen. Congress is highly paid. Um, many of us are unemployed and struggling financially. And more than half of Congress um, uh, members are billionaires uh, and have uh, our insurance that's covered by taxpayer funds. They have pension plans while most of us don't. So what can we do to insist that Congress live by the same rules? Well, I'm strongly in favor of Congress living by the same rules uh, as everyone else. Uh, you refer to several issues. Let me touch on at least a few of them. Number one is pensions. Uh, the retirement plan that I have is very similar to the retirement plan that a federal uh, border patrol uh, or a worker at the Social Security office or other federal employees have. We have a problem of retirement security in this country that Congress needs to be doing more about. It's not that the provision of a retirement plan is unfair to members of Congress, it's that the Congress has not done enough to encourage retirement security for the rest of the country. And we've seen a steady erosion of private retirement plans and now some attacks on retirement plans for uh, teachers and for public employees that I think are misplaced. I think those who work, for example, at the Texas School for the Deaf should be entitled to the retirement security of a sure retirement check and not be dependent on the fluctuation uh, in Wall Street. Uh, healthcare, 
uh, and I will talk some more about that, but I believe that we wrote the law for the Affordable Health Care Act in response to some of the protests so that members of Congress will participate in the same health exchanges that the rest of the country does. I think that's a good step forward. Overall, my goal is to see that Congress plays by the same rules as everyone else. One of the reasons that Congress as a whole is wealthier than the average member of the population is that it is costing an outrageous amount of money to run for office and it tends to pull people into the elections who can finance some of their own races. Uh, and that's, that's a problem with our campaign finance system that desperately needs to be fixed or we will see the democracy to which you referred from Thomas Jefferson greatly distorted. How, how can we fix that? You say that um, the problems with how campaigns are financed, do you have a suggestion and how we address that? Well, uh, the only way, the Supreme Court uh, is now permitting unlimited amounts of secret corporate money to flow into campaigns. And we will see more money spent on both sides, secret money this time, than ever before in American history. Ultimately, I think we need an amendment to the Constitution to address this. In the short term, we need more disclosure of who is making those contributions and about all that a citizen can do at this point other than demanding that their elected officials uh, support legislation for disclosure uh, is to be involved in the political process themselves, where they are contacting their friends and associates where when early voting is at the uh, Texas School for the Deaf and elsewhere, that people participate to the fullest and exercise their rights. Talking about voting, I'd like to ask your opinion on some voting issues. I know that a lot of people out there are still undecided for the big election year. Um, have you met any of those undecided voters? And if so, what have you told them? Oh yes, almost on a, a daily basis. You will uh, remember that in order to deny my neighbors an opportunity to hold me accountable, Governor Perry designed my district to eliminate much of Austin so that I now uh, have within my new district uh, part of South and Southeast Austin, but I have more voters in San Antonio for the first time, the Alamo, not the state capital, than ever before. So it was a very uh, outrageous plan to deny people participation, but about uh, almost 60% uh, of the uh, voters in the district that will evaluate my work this year are new people to me. I have not represented them in Congress before, so I'm devoting a significant amount of my time to visiting with those undecided voters who have not known me previously and talking with them about my work in Congress especially on education and retirement security. Talking about redistricting, um, the Texas Attorney General, what do they plan to do in court? Well, they have, in my opinion, wasted millions of taxpayer dollars that could have been better spent in many other areas where we have needs, education, health care, uh, than on this frivolous suit. We now have uh, a three-judge federal court in Washington that includes two judges appointed by President George W. Bush who have repudiated Governor Perry and General Abbott and have said that Texas violated the Voting Rights Act. And for a second time within hours of that ruling, they repudiated them for violating the Voting Rights Act with reference to the voter ID law. Uh, and we need uh, districts that reflect communities of interest that assure that a member of Congress is close by, is accessible. So when you don't like what he or she is doing, you can find them and you can complain. Or if you have a problem in a more positive sense, individually with uh, Medicare or as a veteran, uh, or you have a neighborhood or community problem, uh, you can raise it and expect your member of Congress to be accessible. 
can you tell us a little bit more about the Texas voter ID law and where are we in the court battle with that? I believe the voter ID law will not be effective in this election uh, because of the ruling of the court. Uh, the governor and the attorney general continue to challenge that ruling, but I don't expect it to change before November. Uh, what happens eventually may depend upon the consideration by the U.S. Supreme Court of that decision and rulings that have been made in other states, but no impact in this year and no new laws on voter ID. You know, the way they wrote this law, many student IDs would not have qualified as a voter ID. And I think of my own uh, late mother, who for many years uh, had only an expired driving license as her ID because everyone knew her at the grocery store that she went to. She didn't need any other ID for her checks. And so this would have uh, really discriminated against many seniors, many students, and many poor people in parts of the state that don't have an office nearby from which they could receive a new voter ID. I'd like to talk a little bit about um, the recent incidents with mass murder. I feel like maybe Congress hasn't really started the discussion, although the incidences are increasing. Where is Congress on this, and um, will there be new legislation, um, or will that discussion lead to new legislation related to guns? Is it too politically sensitive, or is the NRA too powerful? What are your thoughts on this? Uh, sadly, uh, this issue is totally off the agenda in Congress. Yes, the N NRA is extremely powerful. I think there are two aspects. Uh, one uh, relates to uh, dangerous people gaining access to uh, weapons that are designed solely to kill people. And uh, I, I support fully the right of people to hunt, uh, to have access to a firearm, but uh, some of these uh, high clip ammunition uh, is a problem uh, that uh, we at least ought not to interfere with the decisions of cities and states. Uh, the other uh, big issue, though, other than, than guns, is mental health generally. Uh, there are incidences uh, of individuals using other types of weapons. Uh, so guns is not the only uh, issue here. Uh, we need uh, to have good mental health services uh, to uh, avoid and prevent uh, these kind of situations. With the short time that we have left, I'd like for you to talk a little bit about drilling in Alaska. Uh, most Republicans obviously are supporting more and more drilling in Alaska, but Democrats in general are opposed. Can you tell me a little bit about the um, controversy of drill baby drill and versus a balance of protecting wildlife in Alaska? Well, I think we need to make use of all types of energy resources, but I think we must do it in a way that protects some pristine wilderness areas. It is uh, unusual that some of those who have the drill, baby drill approach also oppose any limitation on exporting the fossil fuels uh, that are drilled in those places. They want to drill there, and but they refuse any limitation, for example, on shipping that uh, fossil fuel to Japan or outside of the country. Uh, I believe we need a balanced approach and that there are some places like parts of the Alaska wilderness that ought not to be drilled in, as well as some sensitive places in our national parks and monuments. Uh, there are some places that uh, the current administration has approved in Alaska for drilling. Those ought to be the subject of exploration first before endangering pristine wilderness area. And in the final moment that we have left, do you have any message that you'd like to leave our viewers with? That each one of your viewers is important on all the issues we've discussed. Don't miss an opportunity to participate and have your say. It's one thing to complain about our government, and there's plenty to complain about. 
but hold your elected officials accountable and participate not only with your ballot, but by getting other people to participate. Thank you for your very important comments. We're really fortunate to have you here with us today, and I think we covered a lot of topics today, All right? right? So much uh, fun to be with you. Uh, my federal office is here in Austin. We always are available to be of assistance to individuals that have uh, issues with the federal government. Thank you so much. You can learn more about the work of Lloyd Doggett at his website, house.gov, and at our website, accessnews.us, where you can ask questions, share comments, and opinions. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. One of the beautiful things about America is that we, the people, have power. The more we know, the better decisions we make. For Access News, I'm Tamara, and that's Austin. Thank, Thank you. you. Wonderful chatting with you. Created, written, and executive produced by Devorah Ben Moshe and Ken Hurley. Hosted by Tamara Suter Okudo. Interpreter for Tamara Suter Okudo, Jennifer Stoker. Special thanks to Texas School for the Deaf. Funding provided by the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation. Supported by Austin Community Foundation. Production by Austin Community College. Civication Incorporated, www.civication.org.